Today we're going to discuss how a small papal state was almost carved out during World War I. And I have an expert here to talk about it with me, and it's Dr. Stuart Stalen. He's an emeritus professor of history at NYU, whose field of specialization is the diplomatic history of Europe in the 19th and 20th centuries, and the development of the modern European state in the 19th and 20th centuries. He's the author of Weimar and the Vatican, 1919 to 1933, German Vatican diplomatic relations in the interwar year. That's available on Amazon and I'll have a link to it down below. He also wrote a paper entitled Germany and a Proposed Vatican State of 1915 and 1917. And I discovered that paper while I was uh, researching our recent video here on this channel uh, regarding uh, uh, urban legend about uh, was uh, St. Pope Pius X murdered. Part of the concern of the Germans were, were, were that uh, Bavaria and in other areas, there's a sizable population. Might Would they be concerned that the Vatican might, if, if they took an anti-German uh, stance, fare poorly for them with their own citizens? It could, uh, just a, a theoretical viewpoint. I mean, uh, uh, I think they were I mean, there were all sorts of what-ifs uh, attitude, but the major concern is um, that if the, um, at least you see this from the documents, the reference is sure, um, uh, but um, the assumption is the people are good patriots. Uh, you read in most of them, they are pretty well concerned that uh, um, the other side started the war, we didn't. Um, but the more concern for the central powers is if the, Vatic if the Pope speaks out against the central powers, how does that affect the neutral countries? That's oh, that continually. What the influence, the, the uh, what should we say, the psychological, uh, sociological influence on the neutral powers. The situation at the beginning of the war, uh, back in 1914, reminds me of uh, Stalin's uh, quote, where how many divisions does the Pope command? And now they're seeing the value of the Vatican and the importance of the Vatican. So then were efforts made to do things in a quid pro quo situation. Uh, earlier, Bismarck said, well, they have nothing to offer, offer me, so I'm not going to help them. Uh, did that attitude change in some? Oh, absolutely. I mean, absolutely. Um, as I said, by 1914, it's a different game. Um, you want to make sure you would like to have the Vatican speaking out in favor of your cause. Because A, um, the awareness is that um, his speaking would have influence, as you said, A, on your own people, and that could be the war effort, but also in uh, neutral powers. Because look at the different situations. Just take one as example, America. America's not in the war yet. Well, what if he speaks out um, against uh, uh, us, the Germans? That may influence America even more to join the Allied side, um, that type of thing. And the, the uh, Germans tried this. I mean, they spoke uh, to um, um, certain uh, people at the Vatican to see if the um, American, um, if the Pope's uh, comments to American clergy or prelates and uh, uh, to um, maybe influence the Americans to so stop supplying the Allies with munitions. Didn't work, but I mean, uh, um, you see, the, therefore there's ramifications even on the, in the, cent in the uh, influence on um, um, neutrals so far. So, so Erzberger, who we mentioned a couple minutes ago, uh, did he, in dialogue, try to bring things to the Vatican that might interest them 
to uh, yeah he organized a whole bunch of things I mean uh, he started a, a campaign for donations uh, to collect money uh, to send to the Vatican uh, to help them out in their strapped financial situation he started to suggest uh, questions that uh, would could be done there are various stages of him doing this but uh, basically uh, uh, suggesting that uh, there could be uh, the, the Vatican situation the plight of the Vatican should be put on the table for an international discussion the very thing that Italy had said it will not consider uh, but he says, yes, but this is now crucial. Um, and so he suggests various ideas, including one, um, okay, if you're not going to put it in terms of all the group, let's have a, a, a committee formed of the major Catholic powers, um, uh, Belgium, France, you know, um, and Spain, and uh, they will form a committee to discuss what could be done to create an independent feeling for the Vatican. And then eventually the idea of what about an independent country or state for them, um, carving it out, uh, uh, giving them uh, a seaport, uh, a right, you know, freedom to the sea, um, certain territory, things like that. These are all in the discussion. Which is really the point of this, so the, uh, or not point of it, but the uh, why I first contacted you. So there were plans uh, uh, for, for a, to create a new papal, or discussions to create a new papal state. The, he, Erzberger, brought this up and suggest it, but it always uh, the the Pope um, resisted it um, uh, along the way. I mean, um, the feeling was that um, again uh, he the awareness that Italy won't go for it, and uh, the Pope's feeling was I may get into worse trouble by speaking out and make and just harden this the 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 sides uh, where nothing can be done and um so um even when they suggested it and then uh, as the war goes on um remember by 1917 the pope decides to make the famous papal peace uh, uh, proposal where he outlines what he thought would be a fair and just peace, but didn't go very far. And uh, again, um, even uh, the military Germans felt that um, uh, he was um, uh, that going too far with suggestions. He, the Pope, um, and uh, that. Um, they still hoped there would be um, the um, victory on the battlefield that would give them a better position for negotiating. The Allies um, uh, felt just the opposite, that uh, uh, the Pope was being um, partial to the, uh, the, the, the other side uh, by offering it and um, uh, the very fact that it was 1917, the anniversary of Luther's 95 Thesis, uh, this is almost insulting that he would bring this up at the time. Uh, and um, um, we don't want to lose Italy, so it's not going to do any good. So in, in Erzberger's uh, uh, dialogue or uh, correspondence communication, what I, I found was interesting because I was working on a video regarding that Catholic urban legend that uh, based on a book that came out proposing that St. Pope Pius X was murdered. A uh, prominent figure in that book was uh, Rudolf Gerlach, who was actually a historical figure and was actually, was a German who could uh, do, communicate uh, with Erzberger uh, and then translate to the Pope. 
and uh, he was the conduit, I understand. And what were some of the uh, uh, ideas that were bounced off between one another? Did, did, did uh, uh, Gerlach propose anything uh, in, uh, you know, maybe not authorized by the Pope, but? Uh... No, I mean, uh, this is just, I mean, it just, <laughs> there's nothing important to see. It goes back and forth, you know, what would, uh, a little bit more territory here, what do you think of that? How about this type of thing? Uh, but the point is, um, uh, any time it's being brought up to the Pope, the answer is no. Uh, he's not interested in doing anything on the international level. And especially by 1917, when he um, doesn't get anywhere with his treaty, he still is more and more convinced that the best way to do it is to deal directly with. Um, Italy and wait for the opportunity uh, that the Italians would be ready to do this. And he makes the comment um, that he gets a little bit annoyed with the constant suggestions of uh, international things that uh, he makes the comment that I have more trust and faith in the Italian people and their concept of justice than in an international body. And of course, that's the way we, the situation stays um, during the war. And uh, again, the Pope was still nurturing um, the hope that um, after the war, still uh, he could be invited to um, the peace conference. And of course, it was again uh, a blow because Italy says no and nothing gets done. But then, on top of that, uh, to learn afterwards that he's also excluded from the League of Nations. And that even hurts even more because you're not only in the treaty, but for years afterwards. And of course, uh, uh, so the situation just sits, waiting for the opportunity um, that uh, something could be done. And of course, uh, it uh, occurs in 1929 uh, when Mussolini is willing to uh, go along with it. And when we look at it, uh, um, you see that much of what is suggested in 1929 is a lot of what Erzberger had suggested earlier. A little different. Um, what the Vatican got was a, a smaller territory than what uh, Erzberger had originally envisioned, a uh, bigger state. But uh, you get that. How, how, how big uh, of a state was Erzberger uh, proposing? I can't give you a proper. They, they, never, they never defined it geographically? It would be in Rome, but it would be more than the little border that it's now encompasses Vatican, um, the uh, St. Peter's and the territory immediately. It would be a little bit further out and further area that way. Um, and um, again, a um, seaport, um, things like that, but uh, uh, basically the same. There's minimal differences, except that you could just say it's slightly larger. Uh, it's an interesting thing to see that these ideas were early, but uh, and it's nice to see that, uh, um, give Erzberger credit, the poor guy, he was murdered, he maybe no, and the rightists um, had it out for anybody who signed the uh, peace treaty and Erzberger was one of the delegation to sign, and he was murdered, and Walter Ratnau, <coughs> the um, son of the wealthy um, Emil Ratnau, the one who um, uh, founded um, the, uh, um, the General Electric of Germany, the, uh, uh, what is it, EMG, Elektrosegesellschaft, um, um, he was the foreign minister and he got it. Uh, they assassinated him too. But as they say that 
uh, Erzberger, um, you have to give him credit that he had done a lot because uh, then you, I could play if history. If he hadn't made the suggestions, would it have been uh, the, the Vatican State that we have today? I mean, but you have to reverse that and think of it the other way, that what we have today is basically what Erzberger suggested way back in 1915 with modifications until it was, until the end of the war. I mean, the, the final uh, suggestions that he made but it was always uh, the Pope, I guess, proved right, rather than making a big scene where he felt he couldn't get anywhere, uh, wait for an opportunity. Uh, because it did make uh, an awful lot of trouble. It's a unique situation, two governments in one city, and um, diplomatic formality, if you come to Italy, as Merkel will say, who do you visit first? Do you go to the political or the spiritual leader? And uh, is the other one insulted, you know, this type of thing? And um, especially that was difficult um, when they weren't on speaking terms. Uh, now today you have a much more uh, easygoing situation. The uh, Italian government, um, cooperates and undertakes to do some of the policing actions for the Vatican. And of course, the Vatican is a wonderful source of income with tourism for uh, uh, the Italians. So um, in that sense, it was an interesting sideline. Well, Dr. Salen, I'd like to thank you for being so generous with your time. And uh, I think we all learned something. Thank you. So, okay. Well, thank you so much.